I don't know if, if many of you have read this, but if you haven't, you should. It's such an extraordinary, extraordinary book. Um, and Jewel, how long did it take you to write this book? Writing Never Broken was my first long form. I had always been a short form writer, obviously with poetry and uh, songs, but essays and short story fiction were, were kind of the limit that was as long as I ever got. So I was quite intimidated to write this book. Um, I also did it simultaneously while I was working on a record called Picking Up the Pieces, which was my divorce album. And so I was going through a secret divorce making that record and writing the book. Uh, and so it was a kind of stop and starting process because I was rotating projects <laughs> and, and getting a divorce is a full project. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I don't know, over at least a year, probably. Slash your whole life, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you start like in, with your grandparents. Um, and the thing that I kept thinking about you know, as I was reading it, was there's this line in here um, where you say you must cultivate a large appetite for the things that move you. And you come through all of this really difficult stuff. And it seems like the thing that you kept coming back to is what is it that I'm obsessed with? Like, what must I learn? And it's not one thing. It's writing. It's sculpture touching people's noses it's yodeling when you were very small um can you talk a little bit about that about obsession about the things that move you yeah you know people are our, our modern culture doesn't really like the word appetite um i mean my god we're a diet you know consumed world admitting you're hungry admitting ambition right that's hunger i'm hungry i'm i want something and then getting curious about what am I hungry for? What don't I have that I want? Those are such simple questions that will lead you down a very revolutionary and, and uh, fresh path in your life if you'll just sit and ponder it. Um, and so a lot of my life has been learning to admit how hungry I am. And what if I looked at all of life as nourishment. So let's pretend every single conversation or human relationship is a calorie. What calories are good for me and which ones are bad for me? What's a good form of nutrition and what things are actually toxic? What toxic things have I confused for nourishment? Mm. Um, and when I started to look at the world in terms of hunger, okay, I'm hungry. Am I feeding myself things that will nourish me and make me thrive? Or am I feeding myself toxic crap, toxic crap that will tank me? Um, and then getting in touch with my voraciousness. I'm, I'm hungry. I like to learn. I'm a very voracious learner. Um, I didn't ever go to school particularly, but I love to learn. And finding people to learn from and things that inspire me. Um, I realized I'm also a person that has to be productive. I get kind of depressed if I'm not, it's just my nature. Like I like to be active. Um, and so that means I have to create a lot of output, which means I have to have a lot of input. I have to, it's like the headwaters, you know, and I think as artists, if, you know, we're so, if we're lucky enough to become successful, your time to feed yourself dwindles. And it's kind of like having a river and expecting this river to continue to be raging when the headwaters are drying up. That source, what fills us, what makes us alive, you know, we have to become very curious about and fight for and pursue. Um, I love that, the, the headwater metaphor. Um, and I think you're right, like you signed up to do this thing and you get to do it. And then it's like, oh, but then when do I, when do I think? Um, and you write about silence as well. And you have a practice of silence, of meditation, of like dropping into yourself and sitting with yourself. Um, when do you know that it's time to do that versus it's time to learn more? It's time for more input. Like, is there something in your in your body and your, I know I get, I turn into like a real, a meanie. Um, and that's what I know, like, oh, what happened for you? <laughs> totally relate to the meanie. Like, you know, everybody can tell when I need to go be alone. <laughs> it's not subtle. Uh, 
learning that language, you know, everything has a season. We don't live in a world that honors seasons. We want constant production, constant productivity. I mean, my God, we're obsessed with speeding the seed up. <laughs> it's anti-nature, you know, there's a season, there's a ripening, um, and I just started to get in touch with the fact that sometimes the field is fallow. I don't feel like writing a song. I did start to notice that I did feel like writing poems instead, or I just wanted to draw. Not that I've ever made money with my drawing. It just, for some reason, starts to feel like the season. Um, the silence, I think, is important. What you said about you know your guys' mission of you have to see what you contain. We're each a container, and we each are getting filled whether we're conscious of it, whether we're guiding it, whether we're rewiring it, we are containers. And I think that the more we go within that river of ourselves, we find the ocean that relates to everybody else. Um, it's not necessarily a selfish act to go deeply within. It's a deeply humanizing and connecting act. Yeah. Yeah, which I don't think we're taught as as kids at all, um, like how important it is to listen to ourselves. Um, yeah, and you know, just with my son, I have a 10 year old, I know you have boys, but teaching him that you have to go inside and listen to your feelings, your body's trying to communicate with you all the time and it body has a different thing than a brain. It's a little bit separate. Your feelings are trying to tell you something, your anxiety is trying to tell you something, you know, are you in agreement with your environment? Is what you're thinking, feeling, or doing agreeing with you? Or is it like food poisoning? <laughs> and should you maybe stop thinking, feeling, or doing those things? So for some reason, we're just not taught that type of introspection and we suffer for it. You know, our mental health suffers for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you you write about your writing practice being not not songwriting for the very beginning most of your life you had like this journaling practice um and then this line of writing songs offer different tools like melody and tone to convey and release emotion unlike journal writing and for me this is I'm not musical like I'm you know my grandfather was a famous musician he would ask me to sing sometimes and then he'd be like still no talent um <laughs> So like super like I don't have access to that. However, um, as a poet, and you know this as a poet, right? Like there is something that sound does. We choose words based on their sounds um, to punch up something. Cold is different than frigid, for example, like just the emotional meaning of it. Um, does art, do the words come to you first as sounds or is it in words? Do lyrics come to you as sound or as words? It comes as a feeling mm. and then, uh, how do I describe it? They seem to come together to me, um, but it starts with a feeling. Um, and I can tell by the feeling if it's gonna be a poem or a song. I don't know why or how to articulate that better, um, but it's just a different feeling. It's like being hungry versus thirsty. I wouldn't even know how to describe that, but you know the difference. Mm -hmm. When it's a song, um, I'll get a really intense feeling. And then I don't, I don't write with hooks. A lot of writers will write with a title in mind, um, a hook in mind. If I'm by myself, I don't write that way. I write where there's a feeling. It's like catching a flavor. And then it takes you down a pathway and I don't really know where it's leading me, um, but it's a mood. It's like a big mood and you start mumbling words and you can tell if the mood gets diluted or if it gets increased in potency. And so I might say a word and you're like, that isn't, that isn't as potent as that mood is. And then you'll try other words. It's kind of like braille. It's a little bit like being in the dark and you're feeling your way into a mood and a container, I guess you could say, and you want your words and your melodies to really clearly paint. Um, it, it's almost like creating a physical structure that people can move into and sit inside this mood. And I want it to grab you 
you know, I want it to grab your heart. I want it to be intense. I want it to be potent. And so you just follow the potency. And if the words dilute it, wrong words, um, sometimes you, you lose the scent, like a bloodhound, you just, you hit a river and you're like, I lost it. I just didn't execute. It's hard to describe, but to me, that's what writing alone is like. That's beautiful. There are kind of broad things I'd like to talk about if you guys are interested in, in being writers. Some will be really general information and some will be really specific to music. Um, I think one of the most important things I ever did in looking back at my career was before I signed my record deal, I tried to understand why I was signing a record deal. What was my motivation and what were my goals? because we need a navigation system. And if we don't have a strong North Star, we just kind of wander willy nilly and make random decisions. And we're somehow disappointed 20 years later because we didn't end up where we wanted, although we never quite articulated where did we wanna go. Now, it's not that I'm saying you get to control the outcome or get hyper fixated. It's not really about that. It's more understanding your motivation. What's motivating you to do this? So for me, my motivation was I wanted to learn how to be happy. <laughs> I wrote because I was trying to understand. It was my narrative. It was my soundtrack. It was the way I was digesting and grappling with information. My goal when I moved out at 15, I moved out at, at 15. My dad was abusive. He was a Vietnam vet, had bad PTSD, was raised. My dad was raised in such an abusive home that when he went to Vietnam, he was relaxed. <laughs> That's so fucked up. The poor guy. I mean, it's horrible. Um, and of course, he picked up some extra trauma during the war. And when my mom left when I was eight, he began drinking to handle his trauma and it went predictably and I moved out at 15 and I knew statistically kids like me end up repeating the cycle. Um, I knew statistically I should end up, you know, on drugs or with somebody that's an addict abusive or in an abusive relationship. And I didn't want to be a statistic. It was a very daunting thing to think at 15, my life was sealed. And so I had to find something to believe in. I had to find something that made me think I could beat the odds. I was reading a lot of philosophy at the time, um, had kind of keyed onto this idea of nature versus nurture and the dialectic and was very curious if my nurture was very bad, right? If my conditioning was bad generationally, because we're given a genetic inheritance, but we're also given an emotional inheritance. I mean, there's a river, if you can shut your eyes and imagine a river of emotional behaviors it's your family tree. Mm. You know, there's a physical fibrous genetic bone and flesh family tree, but there's an emotional energetic family tree and the way that we handle conflict and get our needs met and voice our needs and avoid things and handle big feelings, right? All of this is these passed on things. I call it emotional English and the emotional English I was raised with was kind of a crappy language. It didn't make anybody in my family happy, but it's what I was trained in. And an emotional English is hard, right? I mean, think how complex English is. It takes us years to learn it. <laughs> Syntax and grammar and vocabularies and all kinds of structures. Our emotional language is much more complicated even. It's a billion data points and it's called love, mm. but it's a million experiences that get given a word love. And what happens if we're given the wrong word to the wrong feeling? I call it emotional dyslexia. I was told I was loved at night, but I was hit and I was hurt and I was neglected. But I was loved. But it was a million data points. It's kind of like if you have, um, you know, this color green and your mom points to it and says, this is purple. You're just going to call it purple. It's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. The important thing is the experience of this, my relationship to this, this is green. So I realized I had my work cut out for me. And I thought that maybe I, because I had turned, got turned on to philosophy, maybe I could think my way out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, maybe I could, uh, use my thoughts and be very observant and very curious and ask a lot of questions and through that process, learn a new behavior. 
Um, so that set me off on my life's mission. So my writing for me was my medicine. It was me trying to save myself. It was my life raft. Um, it was me like Hansel and Gretel leaving breadcrumbs trail, a breadcrumb trail to my authenticity because I was lying a lot. I was trying to make myself seem happy, make myself seem smart. I was stealing. I was doing a lot of things to be other. And the dangerous and the danger of that is you stop remembering who you actually are. You forget where you buried the treasure. Nice. So writing was also my little breadcrumb trails to, I promised to be honest in my notebook. And I hope everybody does that. It's such a gift to even, you know, the great thing is nobody ever has to read it. So it's not too big of a risk. Getting back to kind of the motivations of writing, um, by the time I got discovered, I knew what I used my writing for. I never thought I'd be a professional songwriter though. So the idea of a contract was a little frightening. Um, and so I decided to stay true to my number one goal, which was to figure out how to be happy. I uh, definitely knew that kids like me, that if we become famous, it's every, you know, biopic you've seen about every musician. <laughs> and again, I didn't want to be a statistic. So that North Star of saying my number one job is to figure out how to be a happy person. I use my art to figure out that process. That's what my art is about. It doesn't have to be that for everybody. It's just what it is for me. Um, and then when it came to art, my motivation was I made myself pick. Do I want to be an artist or a famous person? Not that they can't both happen. Bob Dylan's both, you know, there's, there's both all the time, but I knew I'd have to make decisions every day. And again, I need that. We all need this North star. Um, I write for medicine and I write for art. And so I turned down a lot of opportunities that led me maybe to fame or fame quickly. And it changed the type of writer I am. And so the next thing I would say is after you say, why do I create? What motivates me? What's my motivation? I would say, what kind of writer am I? Um, and I don't mean in my country, am I, you know, pop? It can be, you know. But for me, for instance, like being a singer songwriter is a real particular thing. And it meant that that was now going to be a guiding star. Um, folk music, which is what I consider myself to be, is about people. It's about writing love songs to humanity. It's not just about talking about your boo and putting your hands up in the air. Both are fine and valid. It's just good to know what you are. Because for me, signing up to be a singer songwriter, signing up to be a folk singer meant I was gonna have to be, you know, down for some pain. It's not a real popular path. It doesn't lead to like dollars <laughs> for most of us. Um, and so just getting clear about some of those things is, is really important. Because if you're facile, I, I like to write lots of styles, it's easy to lose your way in your, in your flexibility. And this sort of comes directly to a question that a couple of folks have asked, speaking of things that don't make money, poetry <laughs> versus songwriting. Like how, what, how would you describe the difference? Do you ever start something as a poem and turn it into a song? Um, yeah, like what, what, what are these two things and how are they different for you? Um, what do they mean? Um, rarely have I ever been able to get a poem into a song, which I've always found very frustrating. The, the pacing is so different. Songs typically rhyme. That's just kind of, I don't, I mean, I rarely find a way around it. It just is better when they rhyme. My poetry doesn't rhyme all kinds of poetry does rhyme. It's just mine doesn't happen to. And so the hooks of poems are quite soft. How do we, um, a hook for a song has to have a certain like, uh, like a, a blunt angle. <laughs> you were meant for me and I was meant for you. That's not a great line in a poem. <laughs> it's barely a great line in a song, mind you. But song hooks are different animals and poem hooks are a much softer, featherier, more, they can be very provocative. They can have teeth. So the songs can be poetic. I have a song called Painters. It's just very poetic. It's a story without any real traditional hooks. But if you're going to do that as a songwriter, you better write a banging story because that's why we read stories. Nobody wants to hear it in a song. <laughs> and so you have to figure out how to hybrid that for sure.
Yeah. Um, and in that sort of story, because you put these emotional truths in stories that are not necessarily, the story is not necessarily like autobiographical or about anybody. Um, how do you decide how much to share in your songwriting to still write your truth, but protect yourself from the judgment of bearing personal shame or guilt to the world? And this, I think, is a question artists have been asking themselves um, for a long time. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be in the public eye, people are going to have opinions and we're not going to get around it. So you just kind of got to get comfortable with that idea. And what's beautiful about that idea is it forces you to have an intrinsic sense of who you are, right? That's what we want our kids to have. That's what I want my son to have. I want my son to know who he is, whether he has a job or doesn't, you know, whether somebody likes and validates him whether he makes the goal, whether he doesn't. We don't want our self-worth to be placed outside of ourselves so that other people get to be in charge, right? If I get fired, now I have no value. If my song doesn't do good, now I have no value. You know, as artists, we have to really, really fight against the idea that we are good people, we are good artists if people are clapping, if it's lots of people clapping. Um, and fame kind of forces you to do that because you have to start to grapple with... <laughs> It was rough, you know, like I was young when I came into the public eye and what I finally decided was my survival strategies for keeping myself safe emotionally, psychologically were isolation. I kept safe by being alone. That's why I moved out. I kept safe by not being around other homeless kids. I stayed by myself. That was a good survival strategy until you realize it's entombing you in, you won't ever meet human connection. <laughs> so your survival strategy ends up killing you. Um, and my antidote for that was writing honestly uh, by being vulnerable before Brene Brown talked about it, um, but she's dead right. We all know she is. Uh, we're going to be judged. We're going to be disliked. At least I'm disliked for really being me. Nothing's worse than being disliked for selling out. It is just an extra creepy feeling. So you might as well go down on your own sword. Um, and there will be people that find you and rally around you and validate you. Um, because again, nothing's more interesting than the truth. You can't make the truth up. It's just freaking weird. Our truth is weird. Uh, and it's riveting to people. It's interesting. It helps us evolve because we're watching artists transmute energy and they're doing it for us. And we get to have our energy. It's almost Christ-like. I'm not saying I'm Christ-like. Let's not get this taken out of context. But we get to uh, transform energy, transform shame, transform guilt, bring it into the light. And people get to participate when they read our work and hear our work. Right. Um how do you keep that, though it is your profession, right? You are going to share it with an audience. There is this, that, that thing that you talk about, about like, you know, you're speaking to a group of people to so many ears, um, but it starts with you in your space, telling the truth for yourself. Um, have you had, like, what adjustments have you had to make in your writing practice as success and other people's livelihood has been hooked on to your own creative practice? Like what tools have you created to fence it off? Because it seems like you really have been able to fence it off. And um, how did it change your practice? Fame or I guess making money really off of a thing can change your relationship to the thing. It can, you know, before I was a professional artist, I um, wrote for nothing but a naive wonder of doing it. Um, and something very pure happens, right? It's very, very pure. Being a professional to me is continuing to do something organic and alive in an inorganic, sterile environment that's what you get paid for because <laughs> that's hard 
Um, and that's our job. But you know, if you think about it, all of us go through this process, right? We have a we're bursting when we're 16, 17, 18. We're a mess, we're a shit show, we're alive, we're awake, we're lusty, we're a mess. But there's a vitality to us. It's a real, it's a special thing and you can harness it. And if you become a journalist or a poet or a songwriter or any type of professional, I assume, you're going to start to learn craft. You're going to start to learn structure and you're going to become domesticated. And it isn't just in our jobs. It happens in our lives. We get domesticated. We get married and we start to think, oh, I'm supposed to learn a bunch of horse shit about <laughs> being a wife for a partner. And it honestly has nothing to do with intimacy. It has nothing to do with partnerships. For me, at least, I domesticated a lot of my best qualities. Um, and so remaining wild, getting in touch with your wildness, I think is a really important thing. For me, I just, part of it was luck. Um, part of it was a decision, you know, I, I like the uncomfortable feelings. I like making people feel uncomfortable. I don't have a problem with it. Um, I think it's kind of juicy and uh, makes a live show especially more interesting. I don't like being perfect. I like winging it. And so that affects the type of live shows I do. Um, I want to grow. I want to evolve. So that affects the career decisions I make. Um, and I think, again, coming from an abusive background, a lot of people can understand, like, when you're abused, you can either hide in shame, <laughs> which I've done. And at some point, you hopefully get to a place where you're like, nobody's going to talk me out of telling my story. This is my story. Nobody gets to silence my voice. We all have that divine right. Nobody gets to silence your voice. You get to say whatever you need and want to say. And then you get to go, oops, I could say it better. And you get to try it again. Um, don't let anybody censor you and nobody will, but it does sort of take a, a courageous step, I guess. And then it isn't that courageous. It gets a lot easier. 